volatility rates or frequencies and that kind of thing. Okay. Then, then I'll show you some of the work the students are doing to actually model this. Uh, that will take me halfway during the talk and then I want to go crazy and I want to talk about optimal control and you know, uh, talk about wild ideas, how we can extend this and, uh, and then I'm going to go try to go back to earth again, you know, and convince you that I'm not completely crazy and conclude with, with what I've achieved. So, And you think about economics and you look it up on the <coughs> internet, you can go to Wikipedia and there'll be an icon that's kind of emblematic for economics. And it's always, it's always something like this, a demand and supply line. So if you think of economics, you think of this. So they put price in on this axis, they put demand here, and the more you demand of something, you know, the, the less you want to pay, or the more you have to supply, the more you're going to charge for it. That's the thing. The basic working horse of, uh, of engineering. So everybody can write down these uh, differential equations. You can even write down the solution. You'll get some exponential decay. That's going to be a discount rate. And then you'll get some wiggling. If it's underdamped, you know, that's going to be a volatility. If it's critically damped, it'll be almost exponential, and if it's overdamped, you get this kind of hyperbolic motion that it first goes kind of fast and then goes down slow. But as an engineer, you don't really do that. You say, look, I'm just going to look at the poles. I'm going to make a plot like this. I'll see where it goes, and then maybe I can uh, move these things around and change the behavior of this. So you take something that's called the Laplace transform. And the Laplace transform to me is also one of these things it's like a person from the other sex. You kind of get used to it, but you never really understand what's going on. Okay? So that's the Laplace test for to me. So I learned this thing. Uh, and then I just got a table and I looked it up afterwards. And we'll give you that. I never really understood what this thing was doing. But this is, it's in the momentum, but this, you can just see in economics what it's doing. Because suppose this is some kind of uh, cash flow or some price. Right? It's the momentum. And you take the Laplace transform the momentum. What is happening? At any moment, you're multiplying it by e to the minus st. Now, assume this is not a complex number, but a real number. What does this thing do? Well, it's a discount factor. It's a number smaller than 1. So times 0 will give you 1. So this thing is just going to be the function itself. But now you get, a time later, you may get some other cash. And now you've got to multiply it by something that's knocking it down a little bit. And you do that, you do that. And if you add these all up, you get the, what is called the present value. Of course, it's going to be a function of the rate you're using there, but everybody knows that. If the discount rate with the interest rate is higher, it's worth less. Okay, your cash flow. So this is your salary, and the Laplace transform of your salary gives you your net present value. To me, it's already an insight. I never really had that good feeling there. You know? in insightful feeling, I mean. But now you, you have to smile, because we use this as a complex variable. And economists have, they always have a real variable. So what's the meaning of having a net present value with a constant imaginary exponent in here? Right? That's going to make this thing go up and down. What is that? Right? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's volatility. It's also something bad. If you go trade on the stock market, and there's volatility, and you try to buy or sell, you never know whether your stocks are going to be in the toilet or whether everybody is dancing. You know? So it's going to impact the value of your shares. But it does so in the complex domain. So you see this Laplace transform in a beautiful way combines the regular discount and with the volatility. And you will see that this is the Laplace domain, and we'll plot this on the imaginary axis, the frequencies, and the rates. So these are the imaginary frequencies for us. So if you take an imaginary number and multiply it by i, you get minus that rate. That thing corresponds to the, the actual discount. And then you can look at these poles, and you get all this different behavior. So with its underdamped, you'll just see the thing going up and down. So here we have a trailer. 
Suppose this system has no uh, damping, this prosumer is actually not prosuming, he's just releasing some labor, eating, and then going back, and he gets some labor back, and he's just going up and down, all the going like this. The price will be bumping down, and uh, demand, the flow of demand will be bumping down, up and down, all in a phase shift of 90 degrees. It's very similar to what happens, you know? <coughs> and soon, of course, as you increase your consumption, you're gonna, you're gonna dampen this out. And if you increase it even more, you may get uh, critically damped, so there's no more overshoot. If you increase it even more, you get something that's called hyperbolic. Yes. Now that brings me up the work tool, Edward. You see, in finance, they really only use exponential discounting. And volatility is treated separately, but over damped systems, they will do some kind of hyperbolic discounting, and they consider that irrational. Why? Because if you do hyperbolically, you change your, um, your discount rate, right? You first go along, along one eigenvalue, and then you move along this other pole here. So you may uh, change your mind. So in the beginning, you may be consuming very fast, and then later a little bit slower, you know? Like a crazy person who doesn't want to say they first consume fast and then slow, but it may make sense because maybe later you say, you know, or maybe you go some slow first and then very fast later in life if you go uh, retire. So first you invest in yourself, you know. So there's nothing that irrational about it. And if you call it as happy arguments, but what I find striking is how an engineering analysis will just kind of give you this all for free, you know. It's part of the system, it's part of the way you model it. So it's a very nice uh, piece of uh, research he's doing. To compare that to work that people are doing in finance, it's at the highest level. There is some kind of Nobel Prize winner who's been writing articles on how to think of it. I don't think we're improving that, but what we are seeing is that if you take this kind of approach, there's a lot of phenomena that are very, very nice and easy and uh, to model and also to understand the price. So we see that Economists have a lot of rates, especially in finance, the rate of return, the discount rate, the volatility frequency, etc. And all of this we can see as parallel to a Laplace domain analysis, as long as we multiply our frequency by the imaginary number i, everything will be all right. So, uh, this is the setup that students started using to uh, model things. And I want to step through a few of these applications. This is the work of Marlene Voss, who worked on a model that's called the DSGE model. It stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. So general equilibrium is just when demand meets supply, <coughs> you know, when momentum is conserved, as we saw before. General just means that you consider everything. And dynamic means that you're actually looking how it changes over time. That's not totally trivial because a lot of economists will look at only static equilibrium, more of a thermodynamic idea. It's not always that it's implied. As a mechanical engineer, everything is dynamic or nothing at all. Okay? So, but the, the, they, they have a broader field of interest, a lot of uh, equilibrium analysis. And then the S stands for stochastic, and I want to come back to that a little bit later. So the, what they do is, the, this is a model that is developed for the ECB, the European Central Bank. And they want to have an idea what the economy, economy is doing, and they want to specifically have an idea what, how they can change, influence the economy through monetary shocks, like changing the interest rates or dumping some money, coming with a helicopter, they drop money on the market and see what happens. So this is great for us. So we went ahead and took this model, and they, these guys, they're good. I mean, they wrote everything in differential equations, and we thought, okay, we're going to decipher that and make one big A matrix and then figure out how, you know, this thing works. Well, that didn't work. So then we just stepped back and said, okay, let's just look at it ourselves. This is a mass, this is a spring, this is blah, 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 blah. And we made a simplified uh, model. So here you recognize already the labor market. These are people, households. Households, it says they're consuming. These are the firms that are in the retail business, 
making your consumer goods. They also have the transaction cost. There's an R element. Here is a mass. Here is a capacitor or a spring. Here is these guys consuming. Then, of course, you need some capital, physical capital. So physical capital is like human capital. It's like a spring. Right? You sold this machinery. It's not a flow. It's a stock. So you got to have a spring. The stuff is actually pretty, pretty easy to get. Now, they have uh, their physical capital depreciates. Well, that's got to be a resistor again. You have no choice. And then somebody has to supply. There's demand and supply for the uh, on the stock market and other securities markets for the financing for this physical capital. So these are the investors. And uh, they'll charge interest rates. These guys will charge the rent. These three guys is the output and the range. Right? So you just put this together. And then you can say, all right, so I have two second order systems. It's a fourth order system. I got a bunch of poles. I just simulate it, and I start looking at uh, what the thing does. I compare it to the output they get out of the model. So here is uh, some results. Um, how do we get our output? Well, one nice thing about these engineering models is that you can just uh, say, well, what they do is they apply a shock somewhere. So they put an impulse or a step here or there. I think this is a wage markup shock. So the wage, which is the force on the spring, they give it a, a step. Boy, huh? I'm not quite sure how you really do that, but because I don't think it's causal. But uh, huh? yeah, your salary, you can yeah. change it by law. Yeah, but how do you change a force on a spring? You can only the causality tells you. You can also put a velocity in there, right? So. There's something anti-causal going there, but we can imagine that we do it anyway, right? By law. But you'll see, even if you do it by law, you know, the market will have to, you know, now it's really not causal. And you know that because how do you change the force on the spring in one shot, in zero time? How do you do that? I mean, I don't think you can. Right. You've got to apply a, a, a velocity to accumulate enough position so that it will return the right force. And you can do that in short time, but, huh? Why, why not multi-sign or white noise as an input? I mean, they use... And that's just what they do. Okay. They, they apply a shock and they want to see. They're basically just putting an oscilloscope on the system. Okay. You know, or or you just, like what we do. We look what the impulse response is. Yeah. What is the step response? I'm asking I mean, because for human identification, they use multi-sign or wh white noise or filter white noise. Yeah, yeah. I'll come to that a little bit okay. later. But now I'm just looking at the deterministic thing and how they are analyzing <coughs> it. So, okay. I'm just saying they talk about a shock, and we will talk about a step response okay. in this case. Sometimes they mean an impulse response. You just got to be careful what it is they mean. And then what I've done here is look at their, their results. So this is their results. This is what the ECB uses. Okay. And this is, uh, these are the results that come from if you implement this in uh, Simulink or whatever, and then you look at what the transfer function is between these two. They have a huge category of these things. They calculate it all. And what's great about this engineering approach is, you, you know, once you have the state simulator, you don't care. You apply this to that and just look what happens. You know, in microseconds, you got the result. You know. But it's interesting to compare this. So they do this weight shock, and then this is the price of the goods. So you see it, uh, the price level goes up. Yeah. This is what they. Uh, that's what they think. So if you make uh, wages go up, all that happens is the price level has to rise of the goods. You see, we get this too, and you'll see that it takes off kind of the same way. So they have the, that's the frequency because you see it's not quite critically damped yet. So there is a little frequency in here. So you see the 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 the, 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 co, the, the, the cosine. What is the cosine right? Oh, it's sine here acting. But then it kind of keeps going with the omega d, the undamped, uh, the damped natural frequency. And uh, that's missing in their model. But I don't think they measure it uh, closely enough to even identify it. We just know theoretically there has to be this wiggle. Huh? This is the inflation. It's just a derivative of this, of the price. Right? Inflation is the change of the price. So this is uh, a factor of a zero. If you, if you take the derivative, you add a zero, right? So 
what's the le le lesson here? Well, I don't think we're saying anything different than they are. It's just that the ease of which this can be done, and at the same time, the insights that you have. Like, why is this wiggle there? Why is this? Why is that? That's very different. Okay? And, of course, the big win is, as engineers, we can do this. The other stuff, you, 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 you die. You die. You need uh, education and economics for, I don't know how long I'm going to say that. There's some other work. There's also a model of uh, economic growth that gets used a lot. And uh, there's a whole tradition. It's called the solo growth model or the solo swan. Um, what economists try to do is predict why economies start growing or shrinking. And uh, they have basically first order differential equations that explain what they call exponential growth. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about that. And one that's interesting is not all countries seem to be growing. You have these boom burst <laughs> things where it goes like a uh, bat out of hell, and then the whole thing comes crashing down, and then they go up again and down again. So what tells you, what, as an engineer, what, what tell, what, what te what's the message here? Well, if things are going up and down, you've got to have a mass. You've got to have a second order effect, otherwise the thing is not going to turn around. If you look at the models, they don't have masses. They'll think of the labor market as just a spring. A lot of things are just springs, first order systems. Okay. Or maybe they'll have a mass, but then they won't have a spring attached to it. So they don't get the second order effects where the thing, the imaginary frequencies where the thing is turning around. So what uh, Nicholas is doing he is looking at both labor and capital. They have these models in both labor and capital, and seeing how if he uh, um, uh, adds these second order effects, how he can better uh, see why you get booms and busts, why you get these fluctuations. Uh, the other thing he does is that economists will make changes of variables, like they will look at. Uh, they will divide the amount of labor by the capital. So they will take two state variables and divide them by each other. Now this is kind of funky because then you get something else which is definitely not an inertial variable. There's going to be two masses acting on it. So you can do it, but you're, in a, you're doing some type of transformation, but you're not in an inertial reference frame anymore. So you'll get funny forces like Coriolis forces and centrifugal forces and those kind of things. Now, because they have damping, it's even more complicated than these Coriolis forces. You get sort of relativistic effects. So there are maximum rates at which you can go. You can see this already. If you have a critically damped system, it's kind of the maximum speed at which you can go to with equilibrium. Right? So he is looking at those kind of effects and how that put limits on the growth. Their growth seems to be unlimited. So our interest is that. How do we get it into boom bust? And uh, how do we see these limitations inherent into the changes of variables, the non inertial effects? Uh, Leo Heisman is doing work on the labor market. That's now, these are big programs that are written by the CPB, the Dutch uh, Planning Bureau. Uh, they have uh, nice acronyms for these programs. And they're okay, but there's a lot of criticism. Right, especially for politics and journalists. And he is looking at how their assumptions would translate into a bond graph model. Uh, maybe we can help or, or have insight in how better to uh, do those things. I mean, a lot of this kind of economics is Keynesian economics. And um, this is a quote he alerted me to. The fact that wages tend to be sticky. Now, economists will use a wage as like a force, right? As I explained. It's like if you have labor, and that's a spring, and it comes back, and that's your force. Right? They will call that sticky, or they will call a price sticky. And what would they mean by that? It means that it doesn't seem to want to move. Right? Now, the idea was in what was called neoclassical economics, and markets go back immediately to equilibrium. Now Keynes said, well, that's not going to happen. This is not happening. Because they went into trouble in the labor market and see that wages were not adjusting 
immediately. And prices were not adjusted. So Keynes had a whole theory of sticky prices uh, to explain this. I think it's interesting <coughs> to look at that because if you're an engineer and you look at the momentum, can you change momentum instantaneously? Well, no, you can't. Even if you're from mass, you've got to pour a force and momentum in it. What is the pouring of momentum? That's exactly the force. The force will tell you how much momentum you're pouring in. It's, I mean, the force is speed up, right? So you can't really change it if you have a mass. Now you attach, a, so you have inertia. So it's not so much stickiness, but it's more inertial effects, what we would say. But if you have a spring to it, attached to it, and you have a force like a shock, the spring may also absorb some of that momentum and go into the spring, and the spring will impart it on the wall or something. So that will provide stiffness or elasticity. There's another effect. There's a different type of stickiness. Or you may have a damper, and you push it, this, this mass through a damper, and this damper is just dissipating it into to, 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 to heat. And that's another type of stickiness. So one of the things you've got you to see is that when they talk about sticky prices or wages, we have to be very careful what effects you use. Is it inertial? Is it elastic effects? Or are they damping effects? All of them will modify the simple uh, you know, momentum that's there. All right? Then they look at the difference between the real wage and the nominal wage. Now the difference is the nominal wage is just the wage, when you see it in dollars, that will be just the force. But the real wage that's when you divide the wage by the price of the goods. Now you're dividing the momentum in one mass by the force applied on a spring. You're going to get something funky. But you can calculate what it is. Right? And you can see how these ideas can translate into real engineering things. They're not necessarily the kind of things you would look at, but they're very interesting. Then, what, another thing that's different, for, especially for the control engineer, that we separate the, a model of the system from the controller. So you get this model, you have a car or a drone, and then you have to control it. So the first thing you do is make this model using these bond graphs, and then you'll go ahead and say, what kind of controller should I build, and have some actuators, and maybe an integrator, and this, so I can influence this. The way the economists will do that at the, uh, the BSG model, they put it all together in really one model. So they don't have this type of separation. Uh, that's something you've got to be aware of, uh, which my name was aware of, when you split this. And uh, there's obvious benefits for doing that, because now we can deal with a bunch of things. You can deal with what he pointed out, there's some disturbance. So what would a typical engineer do? Well, he says the system is what it is. But I don't know what's really happening, so I'm just going to put this disturbance here. But now, if I have a central bank that's trying to control it, there's no way you can get rid of these disturbances. You've got to close the loop. So this pi is actually inflation. That will be our output. This will be a desired level of inflation. Or is it? No, no. Yeah, it's not inflation. Yeah. Huh? That's not inflation. Yeah. What? I think we have to be. Yeah. And this will be a picture of a closed loop. Uh, designed for a central bank. That's not what they do. They, they will use this open loop. So that's another opportunity to see how we can use our control knowledge to say, all right, now you want to, we've done, we've done modeling, but now you really want to do something with that. All right? Can I ask a couple of questions? Yep. <coughs> One is, are the models that you're trying to mimic with these bond graphs yeah. The original models that they write the economists, are those linear models? For the, or they are nonlinear models? For the most part, they are linear. Uh, but what they call linear is not the same as we call linear, you see? Huh? There's a little problem. But I mean, they huh? write differential equations. Yeah. Because they're simulating them. And these differential equations, are they linear differential equations? Well, okay. Or they're nonlinear differential no, equations? No, they're usually, they usually linear, but they could be nonlinear. But if they are nonlinear, sometimes when they are linear, but in the second order effect. You see what I'm saying? That's the problem. 
they go look at often, usually they are linear, but sometimes they're not, and you will see that what's happening is if you add a, a linear second order effect, then you can linearize it. You see what I'm saying? Sounds roughly. Yeah, okay, the point is, you never know. It could be anything, non-linear. They'll, they'll just write down the differential equations as they know it, and some of those parameters may not be constant either. No, that's right. exactly why I was asking, because it, it feels right. a bit like somewhat they have these nonlinear models or time variant models or things of that sort. When you extract the first the first principles, you're trying to match them with linear laws, right. like Newtonian mechanics. That's right. And then you get a linear model. Right. Um, which as long as you're operating close to their operational point and you're doing control maybe to, to remain in a certain right. range, then you're gonna predict things very well. But when you look at large variations, then your linearized model with a bone graph is probably going to diverge quite badly from what actually happens in reality. That's what right. You, what you observe. Right. So the answer is, I not exactly understand what you're trying to say. So it depends, is the answer. Of course it does. But if you look at these growth models, then it's <coughs> for instance. Yeah. If you look at this model, this DSD model, a lot of it is linear, and some of it is not linear, yeah. and some of it you go, we have long talks with this guy who wrote it. He says, well, don't worry about that, for instance. <laughs> you know, that's just there. We don't worry about that. Or, you know, the ECB, we have it in the bottle, but because we said this is not linear effect, we said we actually don't use it. And you'll see him just putting a cross on it. Yeah. You know that? I mean, uh -huh. so, so when you work with them, you start figuring out if you can break your head over some of these nonlinear effects, and then all of a sudden they yeah, effectively yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the third thing you find out is that they don't have second order effects. Yeah. And they try to jury rig it, rig it. You know, a little bit like Aristotle tried to put damping into a mass. Yeah. You know? Like you're saying, well, the mass is changing in such a way that I get the right result. Yeah. You know? So it is really linear, but they're leaving out some stuff from our perspective. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So that's why my answer is complicated. Like is it really nonlinear, or is it just, you know? Yeah. I mean, as you know yourself, when we're modeling stuff, I mean, you can look at a circuit, of course it's not linear. And you say, well, I'm gonna assume this inductive is not is linear. Yeah. And, there's, and if it's not, I just get mad at the supplier for not giving me a linear resistor. You yeah, know, yeah. No, so I was trying to figure out like in which ranges things. The second thing is when you show the controller, that I found very, like the picture, yeah. you, just like where you were, um, because, I believe that even the central bank is closing the loop. Yeah. They are just not doing it continuously. And not explicitly. I mean, they, they look at yeah. what's happening with the economy and then they right. provide, no, okay, they now you need to do this for the next years. Right. Um, so it is a feedback loop that is intermittent, if you will, where feedback is coming every so many months when they make a measurement of, of the system. And that's very typical on social systems where you, you cannot measure continuously what's going on. Right. You need to do an inquiry and ask everybody how you do it and what are the prices measure kind of at times. And that would be maybe an interesting we we can deal with that as engineers. Right. right. We have all these hybrid systems theory which will let you deal with that, right. that uh, explicitly. So it, it will provide your formalism for dealing with it. Yeah. The way it works now is, you see, they make this model, and that's what they use as a basis, but that model then goes to a, a panel of people and they're sitting together and they're going, well, uh, you know, I think we should do this, and uh, we think we should do that on the basis of this model, right? They don't have a formalism for closing the loop. They'll do it in a discussion and say, well, we gotta be reasonable, what do you think, you know? Huh? A little bit like in before controls, I mean, well, how did control theory get going? I mean, they, they looked at our captain doing a sh uh, steering a ship, and well, look what he was doing, and he was doing some integrative action, and some derivative action, and some proportional action, this pilot, and they say, oh, okay, that's it, and then they built that controller. So they first look how you're doing it, and then they build the controller. So I think the idea here is, you know, what they're doing is, is, is nothing ridiculous. I mean, there's nothing to sneeze at. It's a serious task. But maybe controls can formula, formula, uh, formulize this and provide a mechanism to, to do some of these things automatically in the same way that uh, an airplane is now landing automatically instead of a pilot just kind of judging and closing the loop in his own mind. You know, I think that's the contribution. 
Oh, yeah, 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 you know. And then you dig through these models, but then you can say, well, it's all well, linear, and throw up your hands in the air. So what we try to do is say, all right, all right, all right, let's not do that. Let's go with discussion. What nonlinear maps we can throw out, how we can throw some of second, third order effects, you know, and see how far we get, you know. I just don't want to get lost on this nonlinear stuff and then get more results, you know. So a lot of these results are, are there to say, well, maybe we're close to God, but we're close enough, you know. Um, I'm going a little bit over time, so you're free to leave, but let me just keep going. Uh, another student, uh, uh, Justin Milders, uh, went to PDBC, spent some time there, and what they do is they do valuations of companies. So this was a valuation where uh, one company wanted to buy uh, a leasing company. Um, and the idea is, how much is that worth? Now, there's a problem there because you got a model, how many cars are in stock, that's your spray, uh, what the demand is for these cars, that's some kind of mass, what your depreciation rate is on these cars, they all know this, you know? And that's, uh, you can make a whole bond graph of, of the leasing business, and then you can predict the P&L, the, the profit and loss statement, and then you could uh, figure out what it is. But there's a bigger problem, is that they've got some business plan from management saying how this thing is gonna go, make enormous profits. So management here is now the controller. And you gotta look at this management plan and say, well, how can they really control these problems? And what do they need to do if, if they assume that this is the right bond graph or the right system description of the leasing business? So he went to PwC, he locked himself up there for four months and worked on this project of valuation and it's a really nice thing again where you have to spend a lot of time in industry, but then figure out what to do, and then you come back here to the lab and you start making your, uh, making your systems, all right? Okay, now I'm gonna go quite fast through this, but this is my favorite part. Now, one problem that you always have is that, okay, this is very cute and well, but how do you know this stuff? You know, you just fit it. You know, hey, maybe you're a good talker, huh? But there is an uncertain feeling about this whole business. You know, like, how do you know this is going to work, right? This is just, it's a little bit the problem with Newtonian mechanics, too. You learn all these tricks, how do you know, this, you know this really works? You know, well, it's been shown, okay. But it's uh, not the right way. Yeah. So, there is a way to motivate all of this. And it's the same with Newtonian mechanics. You can derive it from a minimization principle, Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics. You say, well, nature is really very frugal and is trying to do the most effective thing, right? So you get these Lagrangians, you can find the action, and you can do all this very fancy stuff, and it's beautiful, beautiful theory. But <clears throat> if somehow in mechanics, that's not so um, uh, exciting, because why would nature be minimizing? I mean, it doesn't seem, it seems very anthropomorphic, as if it's a person. But here is where economics shines. Of course, everybody wants to make himself happy, right? Everybody wants to maximize his utility. So if we just look at this Lagrangian <coughs> action as utility, and then we can say, well, really what everybody's doing is maximizing his utility, his happiness, his <coughs> wealth, you know, or his profits, or whatever it is they care about, you know, then, uh, then we're in business, okay? Um, but then, one of the problems is, that, okay, that sounds really good, but what is this Lagrange? And that I think, there's a wonderful answer to. I go back to my demand and supply line, and uh, economists define something they call economic surplus. Here's your price, here's your quantity, and what is it? It's the area under this one. What is the feeling? This is the market price. This is the price you are willing to pay. So what is your profit is exactly that difference. You are willing to pay this, you get it for that, so you're happy this amount. Here you're selling, you're willing to sell for here, but you're giving this, this is your profit. You integrate this out, and you get something that's the surplus. That's the welfare, that's the profit. Now what you integrate, if this is P is MV, what do you get when you integrate MV? You get a half MV square, right? That's not so hard. And what is that? That's it. Right? So this surplus is equal to energy. What if this is a spring? You get 
FDX. So suppose this is the wage, uh, this is the labor. You get the wage times the amount of labor that you've got. And we call that FDX the work. And economists could also call it work. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually a very nice work. Okay? So you see how natural this is. Right? You, see, you see also what the difference is between energy and momentum. Momentum is the price, but the price doesn't mean that anything happens. You can have an enormous price but have no cash flow. Right? The energy tells you what the cash flow is, right? So it's measured in dollars per year or dollars per time. Now you know what this Lagrangian is going to be if you have a linear system, because you know it's the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy, and there I got it, right? So if I go back to my fancy Lagrangian, I can just now plug it in, right? And I can also find that the price is now this partial derivative, as we've all learned or forgotten from advanced dynamics. But this is now just the marginal cost, because this Lagrangian is the cost, and it's the difference between the two types of surplus, right? And you can see that your wage is your uh, change of quadrature. So this whole mechanism makes sense. Now, why would I do this except to be nice and motivated? I cannot choose anything for this cube. It doesn't have to be barrels of oil. It can be anything at all. It could make angles, <coughs> you know, like we do, right? Action angle variables, angle momentum. So now you can look at different variables like capital and the return you make on capital. And just forget about all these barrels of oil and uh, you go to these canonical uh, <coughs> variables. So there's a very, and that's what the people do in finance or in economics, they're not going to count balance of oil, they just look at the total income as being the sum of it. So there is implicitly this canonical uh, transformation, etc., etc. This puts you in the field of optimal control. Then you can, of course, do a Hamiltonian. It's a Legendre transform, but now it's easy. This is cost. That's revenue. What's the difference between revenue and cost? Well, that's your surplus. And the Hamiltonian just tells you your total surplus. Well, it tells you your total mechanical energy that you have. Mechanical energy can be transformed into anything at all, even heat. But when it's in heat, it's gone. So the surplus is, in fact, the available energy, the energy. Right? And the heat is uh, what gets dissipated in the resistor. That's what gets consumed. You can make pretty pictures of the Hamiltonian flow. But here is the one kind of key thing. Whereas we are happy to have systems oscillating and sit on that imaginary axis and look at the Fourier transforms, economists don't really like that. Important for them is the growth, is what is all that realizes. Okay? So this whole Hamiltonian approach famously cannot deal with resistance or damage. They just have to jury rig it to win. So our challenge was to get it to work together. Right? So what we're doing right now is working on something that I call quaternionic uh, Hamiltonians. It integrates, so you get Hamiltonians that are complex numbers that integrate the damping effects or the consumption in economics within the mechanical or electrical effects. Right? And uh, you can see, I mean, if you just have a harmonic oscillator, it goes like this. You just have pure mechanical energy. But if you have damping, you're going to go in. So in a sense, you're already orthogonal to this. So there is a, a, a multiplied by i gives you the orthogonality, right? So if this is a real number, then this will give you an imaginary component to your Hamiltonian. You know? But it's a whole business because it ends up that you have to go to quaternions. You have to go to four dimensions to make it work. You know? This is just a silly thing. I mean, uh, rotation in the plane is a one-dimensional thing that you have to see in two dimensions, otherwise it doesn't work. And a rotation in three dimensions, you have to see in four dimensions for the same reason. You need that extra dimension. Right. So this is a very nice, uh, very nice uh, uh, piece of work that's done by Kuhn Hutters. And uh, this is some trainer who is having uh, exponential growth. So you see he's trading, his price is going up and down. His the, the stock is now, his, uh, you know, his inventory stock keeps increasing. But he doesn't want that because his uh, company is going to explode. So what do you do? You start off with a dividend policy, and you extract the money from the company to keep it like, nice and steady. That's what people do, right? So you, you uh, dividend is a payout you make at the end of the year so that you don't reinvest everything in your company. So a controller here 
would be determining the dividend policy of management. And you can see, here is the controller. It also has a complex Hamiltonian. You just add it to that. Uh, you keep yourself just trading the same amount of uh, throughput all the time. All right. I want to end up. There's no free lunch. This is where I want to end. I got one minute. No, this, this colloquium was planned for Wednesday, and the reason is you get a free lunch on Wednesday. All right? But there is no lunch. Right? Eh? So I want to tell you that, in general, there is no free lunch. So this is an illusion that you got this lunch. Now, economists, there was a famous economist, I believe Samuelson, who had to summarize all of economics with one sentence. And he says there's no such thing as a free lunch. Okay. Now, this is a key idea that ultimately motivates why engineering and economics are the same. Because in thermodynamics, you kind of live the same thing. First of all, it tells you you can't win. You can't make energy out of it, no. What does the second uh, law tell you? You can't break even. You're always going to lose some. Okay? Now, how do you compare that to free lunch? First of all, if I want a lunch, i got to buy it. Or give something up for it to get this free lunch. That's clear enough. All right? So, that's just the first law. It says this, the cash flow somehow has to keep going. Somebody's income is somebody else's expense. Okay? Huh? You can't lose that. But there's a more subtle thing going on, is that here is how I could have a free lunch. I get this lunch, I pay for it, I look at it, I hold it for five seconds, and I sell it to you. I got the money back. I got a free lunch. What? Well, not for very long, but I have this free lunch. Okay? And then we just pass it around in the economy, and everything keeps circulating. Now that's not right. Because if you have a lunch, you gotta eat. That's the idea of a lunch. It's not a gold car bar that we're passing around. Right? But the implication in the lunch is that you gotta eat it. So the second law will hit you. Right? You gotta put a damper on it. You gotta consume it. And those two truisms make it that uh, I think it's the ultimate motivation why these two businesses should be the same. There is no free lunch. It's just the same as this thermodynamic. And what we're trying to achieve with these complex Hamiltonians and Lagrangians is actually integrate thermodynamics more into control. So you can control for the heat that's generated, all this. Okay? And it's inspired by this idea of economists that really focus on consumption and kind of maximize that. They maximize consumption and wealth. What is consumption? It's friction. What is friction do? It maximizes entropy. <laughs> exactly. Right? So this is kind of at the deepest, deepest basis I feel why there is this correspondence. So I'd like to stop there. I went over time, 15 minutes, but I'm just going to pretend that it was an hour talk. All right. <laughs> so any questions? Yes. I think you did a great job at uh, telling us why these models make sense, why they intuitively uh, kind of work. But um, how do you actually validate on real world data and how do, you, how do they actually perform in the real world? Well, one way we do is, uh, well, here, you know, we, we validate it against economist models, right? But are they correct? <laughs> <laughs> I rely on them then to, you know, in this case, I relied on them to, you know, have, you know, they're correct. Here, we went and looked at the actual boom bust cycle of Germany. All right. After the Second World War, it was all collapsed. Right? There's no capital. You have to build up capital. So that spring has to be done. And you will see all of a sudden that spring will release itself. You get that Wirtschaftswunder. And it does a very pretty job in following the data there. Okay? That's some preliminary results we have over here. Okay? Then, this is too early to know exactly where we are. Um, Here, we know what the valuation came out to, all right? So we will, uh, we know approximately what the buyer wanted to pay and what the market gave to it. So we know that this, this model, you know, we know what the P 
PML is of this company, we, 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 we can check whether uh, we have certain things. So it's a difficult thing, you know, but it's difficult in engineering too. Uh, what do I do when I want to validate Newton's law? I take this thing and I give it a shove and I say, okay, a body of this goes at close to speed, but it doesn't, right? Yeah. So I got to put oil on it and this, and I got to like jerry rig it so that it's perfect in order to test my laws, you see? So it's always and, difficult. But there you see that the law is actually incomplete, right? The models you have is they're incomplete. Right. And all of these are incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we try to capture what we think is important, you know, so... Right, but huh? then I thought, yeah, how do you actually validate that you have the importance in there, right? So how do you actually see how, how good your model fits? Well, you look at a bull bust, and that, the normal growth models don't do it, and you are able to capture that, right. for instance. Right? Huh? right? They are using non-parametric uh, system identification probably, right? Based on financial data to validate the model. No, we just compare. Yeah, yes. We, yeah, so and, then, yeah, and then parametric identification. We, we yes. have real model. You already have the parametric. It's not yeah, it's not yeah. parametric. It's parametric. So. We have the parameters <laughs> and we yes. try to fit them and then we try to see. Yeah, right? based on data. Right. So. Right. Yeah, but which, which data? That I didn't see the data yet. Well, here it all depends. Here <laughs> it's, it's data from right. the company. Yeah. There yeah. it's data from the German economy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it yeah. depends. Huh? Yeah. Like the, the I was a bit uh, why, why is sticking to the models? But this for sure, yeah. this model will not work in all other cases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. you, like, uh, you should just uh, identify uh, what's uh, surplus, uh, what are the uh, essential uh, variables. Uh, are but in some cases, it might work, so we can maybe use this model for the case. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to go out and start paying. So I have a moment of this. You would have to see what I'm doing. And uh, human identification, uh, and of course, uh, all of the most of the models are linear mass uh, 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 In this case, it's really uh, in some cases, yeah. some, some perturbations, they are okay, but in some others, they are not. So it's the same with the economy, because of course, they don't work in all of the things. We cannot, in complex systems, we move away from 